Hey, I'm Pastor Rod. Thanks for joining us today. I hope this message makes a difference for you. Well, a few years ago, I went with some friends to the opening night of the new Star Wars movie, The Force Awakens. Now, this was a big deal because it was the first Star Wars movie released in like 10 years. We got any Star Wars fans in the house? All right. Now, I wouldn't consider myself like a, a Star Wars fanatic, but I was very excited to go see this movie. But there were some people who were very serious about this movie. Midnight premieres of the movie were sold out all over the nation. People were re-watching every single Star Wars movie before they went. It was crazy. Now, we got to go, somehow my brother, he really likes movies more than me. Somehow we got to go before the midnight release at like an earlier showing. And so we got finished with the movie, great movie. And as we rounded the corner leaving our theater, we saw the line of people waiting to go into the midnight release. People were in costumes, wielding lightsabers, holding blasters, <laughs> wearing Star Wars apparel, giant smiles on their faces because their moment to see the movie was about to happen. Now, I don't know what happened to me. But the spirit of temptation completely overwhelmed me in that moment because I had just seen the movie. I knew all the secrets. I knew the highly dramatic, completely unexpected moments that they didn't. And I looked at the crowd of people and I just knew I was going to tell them who died. <laughs> now you have to understand, this isn't like a Hallmark movie where you know the ending before it even starts. The crowd of raving fans would never expect what I was about to tell them. So I looked at my brother, Pastor Tyler, for counsel. And like any good brother does, he told me to do it. <laughs> so I looked at Tyler, I smiled really big, I looked back at the crowd. And just as I was about to spoil the movie for all of them, I chickened out. And thank the Lord I did, or I probably would have been mobbed by a giant crowd of lightsaber-wielding Star Wars fans. But have you ever had someone do that to you? You've been waiting to see a movie, read a book, or watch a TV show, but you haven't got to it yet, and then some little punk walks up to you and tells you about Chuck dying at the end. Or you record a game that you're going to watch later, and then right before you leave church, someone tells you the score. There is no worse feeling than when someone spoils the end of a movie, a book, show, or experience for you. When you know what's coming, it completely changes the experience. The emotional roller coaster isn't emotional because you already know the ending. The shock factor of every surprise loses its effect because you knew it was coming. Now, you don't like spoilers when it comes to movies and books and entertainment. But what if you knew in advance everything that would happen in life? <laughs> Every investment you made would be the perfect investment. You'd never lose money. You'd make millions, perfectly timing the ups and downs of the stock market. You would know when you were about to get a flat tire and you could change it right before it happened. You could avoid every accident because you knew it was coming. Your country would have the tactical advantage over every enemy, never losing a fight or war, always one step ahead. You would know what your spouse was going to ask you to do, and you could have it done before she even asked you. The constant debate of where are we going to eat lunch today would no longer exist because you and all the people with you would already know where you were going to eat. You'd never have to go to the doctor you would know the perfect time to leave for work to avoid traffic. You would give the best gifts because you would know what gift your wife actually wants when she tells you she doesn't want anything. <laughs> and you would have moved to Antarctica in February and not come back till 2021. You would know all the answers to the test ahead of time. You would know that that first drink or first pill would lead to a life of addiction and misery. You wouldn't have picked the Arkansas Razorbacks to be your favorite team. 
and they are my favorite team, so I'm with you. No one would have to convince you of the importance of saving for retirement. You could know ahead of time when your kid was going to break curfew, and you could just pre-ground them. You knew who you were going to marry, so all that wasted time and money on going on dates with all the losers would just never happen. And the promise we look at today is the ultimate spoiler. This promise from God completely reveals something that will change the way you deal with the ups and downs of life. And we find it in John chapters 13 through 17. Jesus and his disciples were together for the Passover meal. You may have heard of this or maybe you've seen the painting, but this is called the Last Supper. Jesus was with the disciples eating a meal. And the disciples didn't know it, but in just a short time, they would face the hardest challenge of their lives. Jesus would be arrested, put on trial, and crucified. Jesus' time on earth was coming to an end, and this dinner was his final moments with his disciples, his last chance to teach them. Can you imagine if you knew that tonight was your last chance to be with your family or your closest friends? If you knew it was your final moments to talk to them, the lessons you would teach them, the things you would say. See, Jesus knew that the time had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. They sat around the dinner table and Jesus began to teach. Jesus' words were intentional, meaningful, and memorable. Jesus was preparing himself to become the ultimate sacrifice. And he was preparing his disciples to be at peace with it and to carry on the ministry after he left. The disciples were going to need this teaching and would look to this experience for the rest of their lives. Most importantly, this teaching would help them over the next few days as Jesus was murdered and their faith was tested. So let me summarize in the chapters leading up to our promise what happened. Jesus got a basin of water and one by one washed the feet of the disciples. It was an example of humility, love, and servanthood. Jesus told the disciples that one of them would betray him. Jesus told Peter, kind of in an awkward moment at the dinner, that he would deny him three times. Jesus told them that he would be leaving them soon. And then Jesus warned them that they would be harassed, persecuted, put in prison, and killed for their faith, and they couldn't avoid it. And we pick it up in John chapter 16 with Jesus' summary of everything he's just said. All this I have told you so that you will not go astray. They will put you out of the synagogue. In fact, a time is coming when anyone who kills you will think he is offering a service to God. They will do such things because they have not known the Father or me. I have told you this so that when the time comes, you will remember that I warned you. I did not tell you this at first because I was with you. Jesus was saying, when I was with you, I was the object of hate, not you. But now I'm leaving and they're going to come after you. And I'm telling you this so when it happens, you don't panic. You'll remember that I warned you and you won't freak out. And in the middle of all that pressure, you will be at peace. And the disciples had to be thinking, wow, Jesus, thank you so much for that warning. That was so encouraging to me just now to know that I'm going to be killed and they're going to hurt me. And I'm just going to be cool and calm and collected when it happens. Verse 5, now I'm going to him who sent me. Yet none of you ask me, where are you going? Because I have said these things, you are filled with grief. But I tell you the truth, it is for your good that I'm going away. Unless I go away, the counselor will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. Jesus would no longer be on earth. But when he left, he made a promise. The Holy Spirit, the counselor would come. When he comes, he will convict the world of guilt in regard to sin and righteousness and judgment. In regard to sin, because men do not believe in me. In regard to righteousness, because I am going to the Father, where you can see me no longer. And in regard to judgment, because the prince of this world now stands condemned. I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. The promise of the Holy Spirit is the promise that you hold on to. 
Jesus was only with a small group guiding and teaching them, but the Spirit is with all of us, guiding and teaching all of us. We had the Holy Spirit operating in and through us. The Holy Spirit isn't better than Jesus. It's just fulfilling a different role and function, one that is better for us now. The news of Jesus' departure wasn't a surprise to the disciples, but hearing Jesus say that it would be soon brought some unsettled feelings. Now keep in mind, we know the whole story. The disciples had a different perspective. They didn't have the end of the book. They only had what Jesus had told them. And at this point, they were confused and concerned. Jesus told them about his death and his resurrection. He told his disciples when he left, the world would celebrate his death. But they wouldn't. They would mourn and be sad. But their time of mourning and sadness would not last forever. Their grief of losing Jesus would turn into joy because he would not stay in the grave and he would rise again. And this had to be a really challenging night for the disciples. In one dinner, the disciples felt all kinds of emotions. Honor, love, anger, sadness, comfort, abandonment. I've had a few Thanksgiving meals that were kind of like that. And all of that leads up to the promise we look at today found in John chapter 16, verse 33. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. And you might be thinking, what about everything Jesus just said is supposed to give me peace? I mean, I don't know about you, but nothing gives me peace like knowing I'm going to be tortured, persecuted, arrested, and potentially killed. When I think of the number one source of joy in my life, it's generally not the reassurance of trouble and heartache. This would be like moments before a football game, the coach gathers the entire team and says, all right, guys, the game's about to start. They are big, they are strong, they are fast, they are talented, they are better than you, their coach is better than me. You're gonna get hit hard, often, Billy, we're going to have to call an ambulance for you, but I think we can do it. Or seconds before you go on stage to perform, your director tells you, hey, the floor is slippery. You're going to trip, fall down, and completely forget what you're supposed to be doing when you're up there. Uh, People are going to laugh. They're definitely going to throw things at you, but you know what? You can do it. Good luck. Or right before I come up to preach a sermon, Pastor Rod just tells me, okay, the congregation is pretty much dead today. They're not going to pay attention to you at all. The ones that aren't already asleep by the time you finish are probably just playing games on their phone. So get on out there and preach the word. So why in the world would the promise of trouble give you peace? Why would Jesus say that? Let's break down this promise a little more. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble. The promise of trouble is only for this world. But we aren't going to be in this world much longer. This world is not our home. We're just passing through. Just a few hours before service last night, I experienced some this world trouble. I was in my office looking over my message when my wife Meredith called me and I could instantly tell that something was wrong. Panicking, she told me that there was a giant snake in our backyard right by the back patio. Our dog was barking at it and Meredith was standing on top of the bench looking at the snake. Now being the wonderful manly husband that I am, I told Meredith, kill it. She said no because it was too big, and honestly, I figured she was just exaggerating the size of the snake. The picture she sent me, it didn't look very big. I could even find the snake. So I headed home to kill this mysteriously ginormous snake. I got home, I grabbed the rake, I grabbed the shovel, and I walked to the back patio. Now I decided that the best approach would be for me to stand on the bench as well because the snake was rather close to the bench. Now I still couldn't see it, but I could see a little bit so I knew I was gonna take the rake, I was gonna slam the rake down on top of the snake to hold it in place and then obviously the shovel to 
do the deed. Uh, and it's a snake, people. It's all right. And so I, I take the rake and I slam the rake down on top of the snake. And I'm holding it and pressing it down as hard as I can when all of a sudden, terror overwhelms me. I'm petrified is the best way to... So I'm holding this down and all of a sudden I just see this body coiling out over the rake. And then all of a sudden, no exaggeration, from the tall uncut grass in my backyard, the snake lunged at me completely out of the air. And now Meredith, me, and Satan in the flesh were on top of the bench together. <laughs> so again, because I'm obviously very manly, I threw the rake and the shovel in the air. We took off running, the snake chasing me. Meredith gets to the back door first. She swings the door open, goes inside, and then she shuts it in my face. <laughs> so now I am standing at this door, trying to get in, looking at my wife, who on the other side of the door is pushing the door, <laughs> and I'm begging her, please let me in. The snake still coming towards me. And this snake was fast, people. I I thought snakes were slow. No, this thing was moving. It was like a cartoon. I was scared. So finally, after begging my wife to let me into the home to where I could be safe from the deadly snake, she finally let me in. And so now we had this giant snake on our patio behind our dog house and had no idea what to do at this point. So the next logical step I called my mom and my sister-in-law and told them to come to my house with shovels. <laughs> so now it's, it's me, my mom, Meredith, Emily, my sister-in-law, all holding shovels because we formed some sort of task force that's going to kill this snake and their fearless leader, me, living out my number one fear all at once. Because I need you to understand, snakes are the number one fear in my entire life. Easily the number one fear in my entire life. I hate them. And I don't care if they're nice or helpful or if some are good and some are bad or if that one's going to eat uh, the, the mice and the rodents. Listen, people, I would much rather have a cute little mouse than an angry snake in my backyard any day, all the time. Okay? Snakes, not good. So now the task force is there. We stood outside for like 20 minutes thinking of a way we were going to kill the snake, and we didn't. So finally I called Leon Brockington, who lives around the corner from me. He showed up. And when he showed up, I was standing on top of a six-wheel ladder, <laughs> <laughs> completely afraid of the snake. Um, I, I had a two by four in my hand. I'm not sure what I was going to do, but, and then Leon was wielding some sort of trident type weapon and he walks back to where the snake is and he just stabs the snake like he's got no issues. Okay, that thing was huge. And if you want to know just how terrified I was, my Apple Watch sent me a notification because my heart rate was so high that they were concerned for my health. This was a serious deal. Now, there's, there's no way I could have planned to experience the this world trouble of the killer snake coming to my home moments before I had to come up and preach about trouble in this world. Um, but also, if you're looking to purchase a home, I am putting mine on the market this week, so... <laughs> Uh, just a small snake problem, but, but during your life on earth, there will be trouble. But this life, this, this world is not going to last forever. This world is only momentary. Your trouble is only for a season. One day you will leave this earth and join Jesus in heaven where there will be no more trouble, no more pain, no more sickness, and please, Lord, no more snakes. <laughs> You will spend eternity with him, trouble-free. Now, doesn't that sound great? I can't wait for heaven. But for now, we are still in this world. 
with all its trouble, with all its craziness, with all of its problems. And that's what happens in this world. Coronavirus, face masks, social distancing, those are all this world problems. In this world, we will have trouble. I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world, you will have trouble. You see, Jesus made us a promise. He made us a guarantee. Everyone wants to know the future and what's going to happen in your life. Well, here it is. You will have trouble. There's no changing it, and you can't avoid it. Jesus promised that in every follower of Jesus' life, there will be trouble. And Jesus says, this will give you peace. In the same way, knowing the end of a movie ruins the emotional roller coaster of the storyline, Jesus gave the disciples and you the power of knowing what is to come. In your life, you will have trouble. No one is exempt from struggle, trouble, or trial, regardless of how much money you have or how smart you are or what you look like. You will have trouble. Isn't that an awesome promise? But since you know that trouble is coming, when trouble happens, you won't be caught off guard. You won't be surprised. You can and should be prepared for trouble. You may not know what the trouble looks like, but you know it's coming and you can be ready. I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble. The biblical definition of trouble is an oppressive state of physical, mental, social, or economic adversity. Affliction, distress, tribulation. Another way the Bible expresses trouble is hardships caused by others. And often people say that trouble is anything we go through in life. But it's, it's important to remember the way that Jesus primarily used the word when he addressed his followers. Jesus was talking about the trouble, this trouble, would be the persecution and the rejection that we would experience as followers of Jesus. Jesus explained the reason you are going to experience trouble, tribulation, and affliction in John chapter 15. If the world hates you, keep in mind it hated me first. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. Remember the words I spoke to you. No servant is greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. If they obeyed my teaching, they will obey yours also. They will treat you this way because of my name, for they do not know the one who sent me. The Bible is clear. The world will hate what we stand for and what we believe. And until Jesus sets up his kingdom on earth, the world will push back and fight us. They will give us trouble. They will hate us. Now there's an important balance point to this. Some people claim to follow Jesus but express hatred and bigotry towards other people who are different from them. Then when they're met with opposition, they call it persecution. But you can't use the bad consequences of bigotry and hatred to validate that behavior is righteous. It misrepresents Jesus and it gives his people a bad name. Trouble in itself does not substantiate righteousness. And it's odd to me. The church today spends more time fighting against the trouble that Jesus predicted than preparing themselves for the trouble that is promised. No matter who we elect or what laws we pass, Jesus' words will come true. We will be hated, persecuted, and oppressed. It's not if, it's when. And at the start of the coronavirus crisis, Pastor Rod told our team, this is gonna give us a good look at how the church will one day handle persecution. And sadly, we learned we have a long way to go. Because instead of trusting God for deliverance and just demonstrating his love to others, the church has wasted its time arguing and fighting with each other. Now, right now, you're probably thinking, I am just so glad I came to church today. This, I'm glad I'm watching online. This is encouraging. This is uplifting. Well, stick with me, because that's not all of the promise. I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world, you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. 
See, here's the problem with the church in America. We focus so much on the first part of the promise, the trouble, that we forget the second half of the promise, he has overcome. When you focus on the trouble, the result is fear. When you focus on your trouble, the result is anxiety. The result is panic. But when you put your focus on Jesus, the overcomer, the result of your trouble changes. Your attitude will shift. When you focus on the overcomer, the result is peace. When you focus on the overcomer, the result is confidence. When you focus on the overcomer, you realize he has overcome your fear so you can overcome your fear. Now that doesn't change that the trouble and the fear and the problem is still there. Your trouble is real. Just because I'm not afraid of something doesn't mean it's not real. I may not fear coronavirus, but that doesn't mean it doesn't exist. We have become so attached to life that we live in fear of death. People are petrified that they or their children will get the virus and die. But guess what? Jesus already overcame that. Jesus overcame death because he overcame this world. You have the power to overcome whatever trouble you face. No matter how big your problem is, how big your struggle is, how big your fear is, you can overcome because Jesus has overcome the world. Would you bow your heads with me because I want to pray with you today. Because Jesus promised trouble and that means that no doubt some of you here or watching online, you're in a season of trouble. It seems like one thing after another, after another, after another. And you have found yourself overwhelmed, full of anxiety, full of fear. And instead of looking at Jesus, all you can do is try to figure out how to deal with your trouble. Well, if that's you, I wanna pray for you. If you just say, I need, I need the Lord to replace my fear and anxiety with joy and peace in the midst of my trouble, would you just raise your hand? If you're watching online, you can click a button. Yeah, there's a lot of us. Yeah. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for all of your promises. Lord, we're grateful that you've given the promise of trouble so that we know it's coming, so that we don't have to be caught off guard, but instead we can face trouble with confidence and with peace and with boldness, knowing that you are with us. So Lord, today I pray for every person in this room and watching online who is in a season of trouble. Lord, I pray that you would replace their fear with peace. You would replace their anxiety with confidence. Lord, I pray that as they shift their focus and put their eyes on you, that you would begin to just change the situations around them. Lord, that you would begin to work on their behalf. Lord, we trust you. We place these things in your hands today. We give you our trouble. We give you our fear. We give you our problems. We give you the, the attacks of the enemy because we know that you have already overcome this world, that we don't have to be afraid. We don't have to be worried because you've overcame everything. So Lord, I pray today that we would be filled with joy and peace and confidence even in the midst of trouble.